Loki is the enigmatic trickster god of the Norse mythology pantheon. He is the embodiment of mischief and the harbinger of chaos, a master of deception. When the sly and beguiling Loki graces the stage of Norse mythology, one must tread with vigilance, for the lines between reality and illusion blur in a, a tapestry of mystery. His capricious nature makes you question the very fabric of reality, and in the presence of Loki, all bets are off, and every moment is a mysterious riddle waiting to be unraveled. Now, excuse me a moment, my throat is parched. I'm going to pour myself a glass of root beer. Uh, what? Th this isn't root beer, it's water. Uh, what trickery is this? <laughs> Hi there, I'm TechTweeb, welcome, thanks for clicking on the video today. It's damn hard for a handheld gaming PC to make it in this world today, because everyone that comes along needs to live in the shadow of the Steam Deck. So how does a new handheld gaming PC set itself apart and, and still provide value? Well, it needs to do something that the Steam Deck doesn't, and every device has the stuff that it excels at, be it performance or the screen or the battery, but one segment of the handheld gaming PC space that doesn't get a lot of love is the smaller sized handheld PCs. The little guys. I reviewed one of these already, the iNeo Air, which I freaking loved. And believe it or not, it's probably my current favorite handheld gaming PC. But I have to caveat that by saying that the majority of the stuff that I play on this is indie titles and older games. There's other options for smaller handheld PCs, and some of them seem alright, but the big problem with most of them is the price. When you're paying more than the, the, the price of the Steam Deck for something that's weaker than a Steam Deck, it kind of feels like a dumb decision, even if you want the small form factor. And that's where this thing comes in. This thing has a ton going for it, and it's only 349 bucks. And, oh, wait a second, you can't buy this thing? Oh, what a cruel trick. The Loki Mini Pro is a slick little thing. It's, it's sleek and elegant. It's not the most powerful or feature-rich uh, gaming PC out there, but it's coming out with a price that's not super low, but it's less than the deck. And uh, considering that, it's probably among the cheapest handheld gaming PCs out there. It, it doesn't have much competition. And it would be competitive if you could actually buy it, I think, but uh, you can't actually buy this thing right now. There were other models coming, but some of them got cancelled and then they, they switched over to th this version. But maybe you're interested because you can buy one of these when you're watching this. Or maybe you're just interested because it's actually an interesting thing. I've had a great time playing with this, testing it out and seeing what it could do, and I think it's going to be a solid handheld for a certain type of person. There are a handful of shortcomings, <laughs> as there always are, so if you ever somehow get the chance to buy one of these things, I hope this video will help you decide if it's right for you. But before that, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get myself a cookie. Wait a minute, this isn't a cookie? What's going on here? <laughs> The specs of this thing are curious for many reasons. The, the first is that we get a new chip in this thing. The, the 7320U is a 4-core 8-thread processor with a max boost of 4.1 GHz, and in that processor we get Radeon 610M graphics, which is an RDNA 2-based GPU. And then, then we get 8 GB of LPDDDDR5 RAM, clocked at 6400 MHz, which is kind of disappointing. 8 GB of RAM is isn't very much RAM, not in 2023, so you can definitely expect to be limited there, especially considering that this RAM has to act as VRAM as well. And then we get uh, 128 gigabytes of SSD storage, <laughs> which is, uh, that's like nothing. So you should definitely expect to be adding extra micro SD card storage. We do get Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and a 46 watt hour battery, which is a pretty big battery considering that we're on a low power chip here. And we do get a nice big 6 inch 1080p IPS LCD screen, which I can confirm is absolutely beautiful. Uh, oh, uh, pardon me a minute, my uh, phone is ringing. Hello? Hello? Oh, there's no one there. Uh, that's weird. <laughs> In the box, we get a nice protective case, and inside that is our charging brick. This is a 100 watt charger. 
and a nice fancy USB-C cable and an international adapter. The actual product box is, uh, well, pretty fancy. It's got a sort of animation effect when you slide the cover off. I guess this is the same box that they use for all their products because they just label them on the side. And we get a quick start guide and a screen protector, and there's the device itself. But before we talk about the device itself, I noticed right away that there's a scratch on this one that I got. It it's hard to show on camera. I, I tried to take a photo. The company said to try a pencil eraser on it. And believe it or not, that actually worked. I can't even tell it's there now. It's a, a weird solution, but uh, hey, all's well that ends well. And we get our standard Windows 11. Pretty normal stuff by this point. The device itself feels amazing in the hands. It's not light, but it's not overly heavy. And the ergonomics of the grips and the triggers and the buttons and the thumbstick placement are dang near perfect. We get all the standard controls. You got your thumbsticks and D-pad and face buttons. Also on the front is two function buttons, which by default are your Xbox guide button and the button to bring up the Loki control center. More on that in a bit. Around back, we also get the grip buttons or whatever you call them, which are bound to R3 and L3. And we also get some volume buttons, a power button, and underneath we get a USB-C hole, which can be used for both charging and as a hub to get video out, inputs, and charging all at once. And we get a headphone hole and a micro SD card hole. For the most part, the controls are amazing, with one major exception. First, the good news. The buttons in the D-pad are, are perfect. They feel great. Perfect sound, perfect responsiveness. You'll have no complaints here. I love the controls on this thing. It, the sticks are also amazing. They are big, full-sized sticks, and they are super accurate. You'll have no issues. And the triggers feel good, but this is the major exception that I mentioned. These triggers have a massive problem. So take a look. I don't get any response from the triggers until I get here in the action. The actual response from the trigger input only happens in the final like one quarter of the movement. And that means that we get all this range of motion, but most of it is just empty, em empty space with no inputs, G getting in the way of you wanting the trigger input to register. I'm not sure if this is something that could be fixed with software, but as far as I could tell, it's universal on the device. Every single application or input tester shows the same behavior. It's not like you can't use the triggers, but come on, that, that's a big bummer. They're not working really the way that they should be. It's just frustrating, you know? I'm so frustrated that I'm going to play a game to chill out. Wait a minute. What, what's going on here? <laughs> One of the most annoying things about most Windows-based handheld gaming PCs is Windows. And this thing is no different. I've had many situations of just annoying operating system stuff. There's a shortcut on the device if you hold L1 and R1 for 3 seconds and that switches between controller mode and desktop mode. And it mostly works but every now and then it got glitchy and it wouldn't switch the modes. Or a couple times I would wake the PC and it, the controls wouldn't work and I would require a reboot. Often the RGB would stop working and if you don't have RGB you can't play games obviously so uh, and that, that wouldn't start working again until after a full shutdown and just a, a bunch of crap. I'm not going to list it all and it's, it's hard to know which crap I should blame on the device and the proprietary software or just Windows but the fact remains that this handheld is no different than most Windows based handhelds and it's just frustrating often. The proprietary software does work really good though. We have the Loki Control Center uh, and I like it. It's, it's simple. You can press this little button to bring it up and in here we get the ability to toggle the CPU and GPU boost, although I just leave those on auto. You can change the TDP, which you won't be doing much of, more on that in a bit. You can change the brightness and the volume, change the fan speed, switch profiles on a per application basis, change the device resolution on the fly, which is a very nice feature, and change the RGB, just some basic RGB modes. Overall, I, I like this software software a lot. I love that it's simple and it works. It's lightweight and I heard some people complaining about it, but my experience has been very positive for what it's worth. Oh, come on. Who changed my desktop wallpaper? Is someone tricking me? <laughs>
when talking about handheld PCs, getting into the details about performance is <laughs> tricky, <laughs> pun intended, because it's kind of a balancing act, trying to find the right settings that work well and balancing the, the TDP and the screen brightness and battery life. And on the Loki Mini Pro, it's the same as it is on all handheld gaming PCs, really. So uh, as far as performance goes, it will depend on what you're going to be playing. Don't get your hopes up. You can't play most AAA games at good settings and get playable frame rates, even at the lowest settings, even at 720p, and even at max TDP. Actually, actually speaking of the TDP, this chip is very weird. I get linear increases in performance from the lowest, which is 4 watts, all the way up to 8 watts. And then beyond that, there's literally no performance difference over 8 watts. You could go all the way up to 20 watts, but it doesn't make any difference. You're just generating extra heat at that point. So so that should tell you what you need to know. This is a low power chip. It's going to be focused on efficiency rather than raw performance. And you could probably just forget about playing the latest and greatest AAA games. Come on now. However, the benefit of these lower powered PC products is that we can often get a pretty good performance in older games. And you could play lots of older games on here, but even there you'll be playing all the way down at 720p lowest settings. And even there, there's lots of old games that still won't be playable, as you can see. However, lots will. I was having an okay time playing Skyrim at 720p lowest settings, and it was playable at around 30 FPS. Same thing with Far Cry Primal. It played and it was actually really enjoyable on this thing. However, low spec PC games and indie games work a treat and they look amazing on this screen. And the controls work well. And honestly, just as a mini indie game Steam Deck, this thing is actually really enjoyable to use. I had a great time playing all my favorite indies on here and the experience of playing them is just awesome. However, there are lots of devices out there that play these sorts of games, so it's not like we're getting anything new here. What is new is the price point. It's not often that we get a handheld PC coming in at less than the price of the Steam Deck. And while the performance isn't anywhere near as good as the Steam Deck, the controls, an amazing screen, and the fact that it is a handheld gaming PC that you can use to play PC games is probably reason enough to consider it for lots of people. So even though this chip won't blow you away in terms of performance, it might impress you in terms of efficiency because we can run a ton of these low spec games at a very low TDP. Some of the more quote unquote demanding indie games will have to go up to like 6 watts, but most of these games will run at a 4 watt TDP. And at that wattage, the fan is basically off. It's whisper quiet and the battery is going to last a super long time. And then um, real quick in terms of emulation, just like with Windows gaming, the experience is going to be good for the easy stuff, not as good for the medium stuff, and don't bother with the hard stuff. You're going to have no problem with the early 2D stuff, obviously, or the first generation 3D stuff like Nintendo 64 or Sega Saturn or PS1. You can upscale those to 1080p if you want to. PSP is amazing. Again, you can go up to 1080p and all these games look uh, uh, awesome on this awesome screen. But that's pretty much it. We've reached the limit. PS2 ran, but it's not running at full speed. Same thing with GameCube. Even down at the native resolution, you're not going to get full speed. And Nintendo Switch is not worth bothering with. Oh, uh, hang on. It's time for me to plug this thing in. Ah, there we go. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Now, there's no way in heck that I'd recommend this over a Steam Deck unless you need a smaller device. I personally do prefer smaller devices, but it, it's not so small that it's like tiny and pocket sized. And it's barely cheaper than the deck. So I, I'm kind of left wondering, who is this for? You know, uh, will, would the potential market for this really be willing to sacrifice so much performance for a mere $50 price difference between this and the deck? And I can't say that it would be worth it unless you specifically need what this does well. Lower spec or indie games in a smaller than Steam Deck form factor. Maybe, maybe you need something that runs Windows for whatever games that you want to play uh, if, with, with tight controls and a beautiful screen and you're willing to live with the sacrifices, then yeah, just go for this and have a great time. I personally love this and if I had this to keep, I'd play it a ton, but I, I think most people will just be happier with the deck. I, 
at this price point. And you, you get all the other stuff that the deck brings to the table. But if you want one of the cheapest handheld gaming PCs around, a, an indie crushing machine, and you actually find one of these things that you can buy, yeah, I think you'll probably have a great time with this if you somehow end up with one in your hands. And with that, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to take a break and read this book. Wait a second. Loki, have you been tricking me? <laughs> All right, that's it, you piece of shit. And that brings us to the end. If you liked this video, then check out this video for the AOK Zoe A1, which I reviewed recently. There's a link on the screen right now and at the top of the description below. And you can go check it out now because we're done. I'm TechDweeb. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.